Hi, good morning everybody. I'm Kathy Deere and I'm the National Coordinator for Family Place Libraries. And I want to extend our thanks to Valley Olke and the wonderful, wonderful staff of the Multnomah County Public Library. They've been wonderful. They were here with us at 7 o'clock this morning helping us get all set up and that's really above and beyond the call of anything. Um, so we're really thankful to be here. I also want to thank Jim Shepke for being here. And a little interesting story, I was the last time I was in Oregon was maybe, I don't know, tried to figure it out 14 years ago, maybe earlier than that, for another PLA conference. And at that conference, I got to hear Jim do a presentation on why public libraries should really be supporting early childhood and what that means for libraries, what it means for budgets, what it means for everything. And I'm very happy to be here now talking about Family Place Libraries, which is an initiative that does just that. So we're great, very happy to be here. On behalf of Family Place, I want to extend a warm welcome to those of you that are here for fam from Family Place Libraries, that are here to network and to share information with each other, and those of you that are here to learn more about Family Place Libraries, and also to learn a little bit more about design work and things that were, you can do in your libraries to be more welcoming for young children and families. But before starting, I just want to take a few moments to acknowledge our longtime partner, Libraries for the Future. Middle, uh, Middle Country Public Library and Libraries for the Future got together in the late 90s as a joint venture to start Family Place Libraries. And this continued and grew, and we know Libraries for the Future was around for 17 years, helping libraries transition into the digital age, build collaborations and partnerships, and work with all people starting at birth for all ages. And they were very instrumental in getting Family Place to move from one library on Long Island to the national model that it is today. So I just want to thank them for everything they've done for libraries. For those of you that may not be aware, Unfortunately, early last year, because of the economic downturn, they did have to close their doors, but they've been instrumental in so much, and I just wanted to acknowledge them here today. To begin the agenda, I'd like to take a few minutes to share some highlights about what's been happening in technology, the expansion of Family Place Network, and our partnerships. And late in 2008, we field tested our first online training components, and by April 2009, we achieved our goal of reducing our on-site training from four days to three days. Four days was really hard for people, especially if you were coming from the West Coast, that was six days counting traveling. To be away from families, to be away from your library, that was really quite a burden. So now what we did is we have components available 24-7, and we have convenient access to select training components that are now online 24-7 that anybody can get to. And then we're also putting continually updates on there. So annually, we update everything. People that have attended the training that are in the system will be able to see that. You won't have to worry about sending out papers, about putting things other places. And we're soon going to begin the process of taking all of our pre-2009 sites and putting them into this Adobe Connect system so they will have the same access. So our future plans include offering virtual network meetings and webinars to support the growing network of national community family-centered libraries. Since our last symposium a couple of years ago, we've had 110 librarians representing 64 libraries attend our training institute. Colorado is our most recent state, and we have the uh, director of the of the Anything Libraries from Rangeview here today, and that's Pam, where's Pam? Pam Smith, and we also have Linda Fries in the back. And they're actually working on a major renovation project in all of their branches that's going to incorporate some of the Family Place components into them. And in addition to this, they're most excited about building a flagship library that will have an 8,000 square foot children's room. And a lot of that is really a result of all the Family Place work that they've done and what they've learned over the last few years. Pennsylvania is the first state in 2002 to provide competitive grants supported through LSTA funds to expand the initiative throughout their state. And during the past two years, they've added 15 additional sites and sent new librarians to exist from existing sites to training. 
Plans are to add another 12 libraries in the fall, which will total 80 libraries in the state of Pennsylvania, which is our biggest cluster ever. And Susan Pannerbaker just walked in the door back there. Hi, Susan. And she is the youth services person from the state, and she's the person behind getting all of this together. And we'll be here throughout the morning if you have any questions that you'd like to ask her. In 2004, the Pennsylvania State Library Association established an annual Best Practices Award in early childhood. Family Place libraries in that state have had a very, very strong showing in achieving these awards. In fact, the James B. Brown Library, which was the very first library in Pennsylvania to join Family Place in the year 2000, received an award five of the last six years. And the Sherlin North Hills Library was not only a recipient of the award, um, Ingrid, and I hope I say your name right, Ingrid, I always get this wrong, In Ingrid Catchthaler also received Library Journal's 2009 Mover and Shaker Award. So congratulations, Ingrid. <clears throat> California is really the biggest news in Family Place expansion and upcoming Family Place expansion. A million dollar grant from First Five LA, a child advocacy organization, is funding the development of 20 family place libraries in the county of Los Angeles. And they already have probably about 25 or 26 sites out of their 88 sites there. And then also other, com other libraries around that community that are not part of the county of Los Angeles. It also helps support the development of a training center at the Carson branch of the county of Los Angeles library. And expanding statewide collaborative efforts the State Library of California, the County of Los Angeles, and Family Place all work together to be able to produce the first California-based Family Place Training Institute. And we did that last November. It was wonderful. A great deal of work, a great deal of compromise on everybody's part, but it was really wonderful. And uh, 26 librarians and administrators from 13 libraries throughout the state, North, Central, and Southern libraries, participated in the training and are now in the process of implementing the project. They also plan to offer a second round of LSTA grants in 2010, if and when they get a budget. So we're all very happy and really looking forward to that. Unfortunately, Bessie Condos, the Youth Services Consultant for the California State Library, could not be in Portland this week, but she asked that I, she, I read this message. And here we have Family Place is a win-win project that couldn't have come at a better time for California public libraries in light of our economic issues that you have all read about. Our first year program is being evaluated by Dr. Virginia Walters of UCLA, and by the end of the grant year we will have 13 early learning centers in libraries. If you've ever wanted to change how services are provided to children in your library, then Family Place is the program for you. And she asks to please feel free to contact her at any time if you have any questions, any concerns, and she'll be glad to talk to you about that. <clears throat> it's evident that partnerships and collaborations are core components of our work. And nationally, Family Place is partnering with a number of dynamic national organizations to combine the best practices of these groups with our program. So this is Get Ready to Read, and we did early literacy kits with them, specialized trainings, and web resources on their website to increase the capacity of librarians to support early literacy and parents as first teachers. Because we all know it doesn't matter what we do in libraries. They come to a story hour once a week. They come to a program once a week. If that does not happen, when you go home, if that parent, if that caregiver is not continuing in doing this, it's really not as effective. And it's kind of a drop in the ocean in a lot of ways. So we really want to engage the parents and caregivers. And we've actually offered six different trainings throughout the United States, and everybody that attended the training received a free Get Ready to Read kit. Public television and public libraries joined forces to improve literacy. With funding from the National Institutes of Health, Family Place completed our work with Serious Thinking, one of the producers of the PBS Between the Lions program. Together, we created library-based reading dens, which combined the resources and expertise of that program with those of public libraries. Over 380 children, these were all kindergarten children, from diverse urban and suburban areas participated in the study one of the few controlled research projects that actually looks at the learning that takes place in public libraries. 
Results from the pre and post test show significant increases in letter naming fluency, decoding skills, and knowledge of letter sounds of the children that participated in the DEN and their parents, because there were also parent components as part of this, versus the control group. Parents' observations and self-reports indicated that after the project, they were much more comfortable engaging in playful literacy activities with their children. And many commented, and it was just amazing that they said, I didn't know you could just play games and have fun, and this could be fun. And it could be something we really like to do. It wasn't a chore. It wasn't a ditto. So they really had a great time. If you'd like to see a complete report, you can go to our website, www.familyplacelibraries.org. And these are some of the, is this, is this in focus or is this my eyes? Is this okay, guys? Okay. These are some of the different things when we did the den. People actually got to walk in. They got to play. We had different carts for the kids that were participating. And we did pre and post testing. And it was really quite effective. This was a, a five-month program uh, an evaluation that we did. We did it in New Haven, we did it at Middle Country, and we did it at Freeport Library. So we also did it with people that did not speak English, so there was a very diverse group of people that we worked with. <clears throat> On Long Island, we have a lot, I don't know if you can hear me without this. On Long Island, we have a lot of different collaborations. One is with the National Association of Mother Centers, and this is a group where mothers themselves run the group. We partner with them in giving them space and giving them resources and giving them some of the materials that they need, but this is a self-run peer model. So the library is not a library-run program. It's really a mother's program where they do it themselves. The Parent-Child Home Program is also a national program that's been around for close to 50 years now. It's a home-based visiting program for children starting at two years old, and they're just starting to institute one for younger children. And the home visitors go in and they bring a book, they bring a toy, and libraries have actually started their own parent-child home programs, or they have partnered with the existing parent-home-child programs in their community. And this allows us to really reach the most at-risk families that really cannot get anywhere. They have no transportation, and they're really the most at-risk families in our community. <coughs> and the Child Care Councils of Suffolk and Nassau were partnering with to do something called Kids in Care, which is outreach to family home child care providers, and we bring in materials for them, we model how to use the materials, and we also have resources for them in the library and invite them to do different things in the library at the same time and form a network. Okay. Our most recent collaboration <clears throat> is with the Early Years Institute. For the past two years, Family Place has partnered with the Early Years Institute to provide play trainings for librarians, as well as mentors that actually went into the individual libraries and worked with the librarians in the libraries on the floor to help increase the librarian understanding of the vital importance of early childhood play on children's development. They also learn strategies on how to share some of this with parents. So parents will realize that it is as important to have blocks in your library as it is to have books in your library because they're all contributing to child development and early literacy skills. So our next step is to create an online play webinar, which we plan to do with them this year. And we will then have that on the Adobe system for all the Family Place libraries to be able to participate in. And collectively, you can see from this list, Family Place Libraries locally are partnering with at least a thousand different agencies that we know of in collectively in their local jurisdictions. And so we can then provide the family support and the social, emotional, and cognitive development of youngest children, enabling productive future generations. And we can't do this alone. As you know, Ellen, you're doing so many wonderful things. We have to partner with everybody. The library can't stay in its silo. We really have to get out there with everybody. And individually, Family Place has really turned some of these uh, partnerships into very strong alliances. And I don't have time now because we're running a little behind time, but I really want to be able to share some of this with you and maybe when I do the Family Place piece at the end, the second half of this, I'll be able to share some of the wonderful things that are happening in our libraries. And this is space. 
And new sites report usage soars after implementing Family Place and their libraries. The development of physical space is definitely the most visible influence, and it really draws families with little ones to the libraries. These libraries have become community destinations for families with young children, with a national average of 700 kids per month coming in to utilize these spaces to play and learn together with their adult in these inviting environments. And these are just a few examples of some of these spaces. Okay. <clears throat> this top is before and after. This is Norfolk Public Library, one of their branches. You can see what that space looked like before. Just had a few round tables and a rug, very little. After they instituted Family Place and developed their space, this is what it looked like. And unfortunately, the picture doesn't take the whole left side and it has a lot more materials and things like that and comfortable seating for parents there. On the bottom, this is the Carson Library, which had their training center. This is what they had. They had a few things out, a few toys, very disorganized. This is what it looks like now. And this is the new flagship branch of the Norfolk Public Library, the Pretlow Library. They have a 10,000 square foot children's room. And I just put in these two pictures because in addition to all of the other learning toys and materials and all the books and things that they have, they also are the first library to put in children's playscapes. And these are two pictures of the playscapes that they have there for young children. And I just love this right over here because it's a mirror. And you know how little ones love to see themselves in the mirror. Little ones and cats, you know, and kittens. They just love to see themselves in the mirror. OK, and I think, I think that that is probably it. So we, here, we should have Lawndale. We have one more. And I don't know why this, oh, OK, two more. <clears throat> this is a brand new library in the county of Los Angeles, the Lawndale Library, and they've created two wonderful spaces. This is in one part of the children's room, and if you go to that side, this is another. This is a much more active space where it could be busy and noisy, and there's blocks and everything, and they've done a wonderful job creating all of this. And this is our Middle Country Public Library. And this is our family place space, which actually looks quite different now because we're always evolving and always changing. But this is what it looked like a few years ago. And you can see how people are just drawn to it and using everything. And I just love that little boy. I took that picture, and he was having such a good time driving his race car. He had a grand time. So we hear over and over again how the systemic change brought about by Family Place influences both the need for and design of such spaces. And today, we're very, very fortunate indeed to have renowned architect Jim Keller with us to share his information and his expertise. Mr. Kelly. I'd like to just start by asking you to think a little bit about space. Um, I'm here really to share with you some ideas about the building blocks of creating space for young children. And I, I know that I have one colleague here, another architect, Margaret uh, Sullivan, who is actually part of this project, the design of this building. And when you enter architecture school uh, in your first year, the first, one of the first things that happens is you stop talking about rooms and you start talking about space. And so when you think about space, rooms become an assignment to a space after the building is designed or is completed. So when you think about space, there are some basic building blocks or basic elements of, it, of, of space. And I wondered if anybody just wants to come up and share some ideas, wake up a little bit, and, and share some ideas of what some of the simple basic elements of a space or a room might be. Any, anybody? No? OK. Light. Light, great, light. Place Color. To sit. Color. Place to sit, furniture. Anybody else? Open space. Open space, the space itself. The use. The use. Any other elements of the space, of creating the space? Uh, spaces to be quiet, spaces to collaborate, spaces to be noisy. Okay, a variety of type of spaces. Ceiling height. Ceilings, ceiling height, that's great. Any others related to ceiling? Boundaries. 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 Walls. 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 Walls, great. Floor. And the floor. Well, if I can get this to move. Hmm. It was working, right? It was working. Can you just advance my slides for me, Kathy? That's great. <clears throat> the, 
the elements or the building blocks that I thought of just in general terms um, that really go into creating space start with really the floor or the foundation. It's the first thing. And it's really appropriate to what all of your work is because the floor is really the thing that children experience the most. It's what they see, it's what they're closest to, and some of you who have been part of the Family Place training may have gone through the exercise, and if you haven't, I suggest you do this when you get back to your library, or you can do it in your hotel this evening, or maybe on the convention floor you might get strange looks, but sit down on the floor. We decided we couldn't all sit down on the floor in this room, it's a little too crowded. But sit down on the floor and just look at what the space looks like. What do you see? What are the important things? You might have to even lie down on the space because for a small child, even an adult like me, sitting down isn't really the right eye level to perceive the space. You'll see things like baseboards and electrical outlets. The floor pattern will appear differently. The colors will, will appear differently. The whole scale, the ceiling height, the whole scale of the space will be very, very different. And so that other element which one of you mentioned, which is the boundaries or the edges, is the walls, a critical part of creating space for children. The ceiling. Ceilings are often overlooked in designing space for children. And I think it's partly because in recent years, those of us who have either specialized in design or focused on design of space for children have been really focusing on the floor and the lower walls and the furniture and those things. But I think the ceilings are really an important part of the space for children too. Light, clearly, both natural and artificial. The furniture, as you mentioned, and then the whole space itself. Oops, I went the wrong way. So floors. Is this, can you see these images? This one's a little light, but I think the next one will be okay. Um, <clears throat> floors can be very special places for a variety of activities. And you can create zones by using patterns. You can create zones by using different material types. You can provide direction, wayfinding. Is that better? Mm -hmm. You can provide direction and wayfinding through the use of both patterns and zones. Um, floor can have textures, whether it's a soft texture for seating or whether it's uh, a, an easy texture like a rubber floor or a marmoleum floor for people who need to stand or a cleanable floor for crafts and activities like that. And another consideration, not really an element of the space, but consideration is really comfort of the floor. I, I, I keep going the wrong way, I'm sorry. I'll get this right. So some examples. Hard surface floors aren't very popular in the United States. But I would say in most of the rest of the world, hard surface floors in children's areas are very common. In fact, you might almost say popular. Uh, a variety of materials from rubber flooring to marmoleum type products to a vinylized type a wood looking flooring which is used here in the Santiago Public Library. Uh, natural and synthetic materials. What has to be done when using a material like this which provides some benefits, cleanability, flexibility, is providing things like mats, uh, pads, cushions, other kinds of elements of furniture types of things so that the space can be flexible and be used. <clears throat> this is the uh, village branch in the Lexington uh, Public Library in Kentucky. Um, and this is an example of defining activity areas with material transition. This was an all, old AutoZone store. It came complete <laughs> with black and white checked tile and the wonderful roller rink fluorescent lights. And it was a fast track project. It was done in about five months from design to implementation, completion and opening. And it was done on about $50 a square foot. And so obviously we retained almost everything that we possibly could. And we used carpet in this front area and in another back area, which is the young children, to define the zones for young children to sit and be comfortable. This is an example of maybe not a good use of material transition, because there is really not a transition. But there's a floor transition here in this before photograph of one of the free library branches. It's a very dangerous transition, because I don't know if you can see the edge of the step. You really, I think the first time I walked in there, I didn't see it. 
because I was looking at something else, and uh, tripped down into that story pit. So there's nothing to define the edge or the boundary. There's nothing to say there's something special other than this sort of architectural element that was created by the original architect of the building. And so it's important that spaces for children are accessible. So we leveled the floor and used patterns to reinforce the idea that this is really a special space for young children and families to come in this relatively small branch library. I think it's about 7,000 square feet, the whole building. There, these were relatively, all of these Free Library of Philadelphia projects that you see, there may be a half a dozen in this show, uh, were relatively tight budget projects. Uh, so we had to leave elements and make the most out of the elements that were in the architecture, like the little frame. <coughs> Integrating motifs and ideas from the neighborhood can, can really bring the community in. This is a branch library that's near a city park that is really more like a national forest preserve. And so the desire there was to really bring the park into the children's area of the library. That was done with the carpet design, the furniture design, even the tabletops, which I don't think you can really see here, have animal prints on the plastic laminate. And then an artwork piece that ties in the, the city, the connection to the city and to the park. You can actually see the city from not far from the library. There's a view, nice view. Low surfaces, as we talked about, sitting on the floor, experiencing it, these are what children really, really do see and experience. This is actually the Horsham Township Library, which, Susan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe is now a family place? Yes, it is. Library. It was designed in 2004, 2003 and 2004. It was designed to be able to become a family place library. And so this is one of the two spaces that will be able to accommodate the programs. This is their storytale place or program room. And the idea here was to also incorporate not only the floor, but the whole of the space. So the entire space is really surrounded on two walls by tackable wall surface. And this is empty because this was our professional photography. But it's almost always filled with children's artwork from low to high. And then there are actually two of the walls are glass doors that open so the programs, whether it be family place or story hour, can expand out. This is an example, I think this is a great example. It's a, for slightly older children, but the Indianapolis Public Library by Wollen Moulton uh, of just a very simple transition. To, it really shows you the difference in zones from a, a, a reading area or a collection area into a higher activity area by just changing the floor tile from a pattern to a solid. Excuse me just a second. This is another before example, um, example of all the things that don't really work with a floor pattern when you talk about things like wayfinding, creating zones, uh, patterns that reinforce the mission of the library, make the place welcoming. It was a 1950s intervention into a Carnegie branch, a really handsome Carnegie branch, that really worked at counter purposes with the architecture of the building. And so this is the most ethnically, racially diverse neighborhood in the city of Philadelphia. And it was the desire of the staff and the, the community people that we were working with in this branch to really say, everybody's welcome the minute you walk in the door. And so a big part of that was the floor. It was out of marmoleum and carpet, zoning, different textures, different areas saying you're welcome. The first thing that you see when you walk in the door is the other half of this circle of the, peop the, the figures with, of all colors. The um, back of the image is actually the area for young children. In all of these branches, and some of you may have these old Carnegie branches, we're sort of stuck with the built-in bookcases. There wasn't really money to, uh, to change those. But even just changing the color and providing other furniture which is appropriately scaled and appropriate heights really makes the difference. Uh, this is the Middle Country Library for any of you who've been to Family Place training. Um, again, this was uh, Hardy Holtzman. <laughs> Margaret was involved in this. Uh, a, a great example of just a floor pattern that reinforces the direction. You come in this really dramatic lobby and there's really no question. It's just a sub subliminal, subconscious thing where you're supposed to go to get to the welcome desk and where you're supposed to go to get into the library, into the circ desk, because the floor pattern goes in that direction, terrazzo tile. This is an example where there's no direction. The before, 
of uh, the Musselson branch of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Very plain, very boring, lacking any kind of information, uh, zoning, or, or any kind of effect. This is a complicated building in a way because it's the, it, the, you enter in the center and there's equal space on two halves. And so um, while the library manager here was an adult services librarian who didn't really want to make the whole library like a children's library, we wanted to convey the message that there's something awaiting. And so this is what we did to, to create a pathway to an area that is partly children's and partly adults. And the children's area is actually a circus theme, and so we pulled a little bit, as subtly, we thought subtly, um, the circles and a star of the circus theme into the floor pattern. And this is where you, when you arrive. And I'm not on furniture yet, but we actually used the furniture here, again, as a sort of a budgetary thing to create zoning, or walls, if you will. Getting to the children's library in Muscat, Oman, um, in Oman, it's fairly traditional to have conversation, a meal, um, some other kind of social gathering, tea or coffee, seated on cushions with cushioned backs. It may be in a house, it may be in a public place, it may be on a roof. I had a wonderful dinner when I was there on a, a roof of a women's center. And so this is actually the uh, Omani seating area at the uh, Children's Learning Center at SKU in Muscat and in the library part of the Learning Center. And so when we designed the new children's library, we took the idea and we created an Omani seating area on two floors. This in the lower right hand corner is the Omani seating area for young children. And actually, now I'm gonna wanna go back. You see the little boy in the right hand corner? The wonders of, oops, I see, I just can't get this. Wonders of Photoshop. He's sitting there <laughs> in our Omani seating area. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so that area is created with low shelving, and in the interior there would be cushions and cushion backs all the way around, uh, around this space. Floor pattern can serve as a pathway and a connector, and it can do more than just be the floor. And this is a wonderful library in Denmark, in Hjoring, Denmark. Uh, the architect was Bosch and Ford. I don't know them, but I do know the library director here. And really this is called, they nicknamed this the Red Ribbon Library. And this red ribbon which runs through the floor and up through service desks and around collections is really the identifier. This library is actually in a large shopping center. And here it creates boundaries around the children's area. And it runs up and that's the children's service desk there with the blue chair. Very dynamic, a lot of interaction with all of the activities. A more scaled back project. This is another thing of bringing the community in. Um, there was a very important tree in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. Uh, I believe it was a sycamore tree. Uh, and it's very, very important to the town. And so the library wanted to bring that tree idea into the library. We really didn't have any room or wall space, so we put it on the floor. And um, it's, it's a very, this is a small library, it's about 7,000 square feet, and the children's area I think was about 3,000 of that. <clears throat> so this is the children on the floor with the puppet show going on. So the floor patterns can re relate to the walls, to the furniture in different ways as well. And to the walls. Walls are a wonderful place for, I'm jump, jumping ahead to artwork, Actually, this image you may be able to see in the middle of the globe is a covered painted over switch plate because this is actually a wall in the Overbrook Park Library in, in Philadelphia. Walls serve to create edges, as we said. They can be places of interest, safety. Uh, they're places for artwork and apertures. Apertures can be windows, doors, other kinds of openings, little open openings. And walls provide comfort too. And I think the walls or the boundaries, whatever the walls are, whether they're furniture or actual physical walls, need to take into consideration safety and comfort. So back to this, just again, they all come together to create a comfort zone. Here's, here's a before where there really isn't a comfort zone, where the walls don't do anything to reinforce again the mission. 
If you see in the back of this image, there is a green door under the exit sign. There's a tall extension ladder. This is an egress, so this had to stay. The millwork that was constructed when this library was built is uh, bright yellow laminate. Um, the library hated this, and the shelving is all sort of metal shelving built into that. Again, there was not budget here to rip all of that out. The money just didn't exist. So what we did was we worked with it. So we built up on top of the millwork with more millwork, <clears throat> created a constellation uh, design, a mural design, tied that in with, again, the carpet patterns, more subtle in this case than some of the others. And uh, even the seating has constellation-related cutouts in the chair. <clears throat> Back to Village Branch. This is actually the uh, multimedia collection. Uh, in This library has since been expanded. It's about twice the size it, it was. So it's about 8,000 square feet now. But um, it was, it's a very multicultural neighborhood, a large Spanish uh, collection here, a large Spanish speaking population. This place is crazy. It's a wild library to go into. There are literally so many people in this library at any given day, time of day or night, you almost can't get in. And I'm not exaggerating that. But there was a need to have large spaces for children's programs. But there, there's a small meeting room, but it really wasn't room to accommodate everything they needed programmatically. So we put the furniture, these uh, 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 shelving on wheels. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm supposed to be talking about panels. We created panels that are actually flexible, and I'll come back to the shelving on wheels later, uh, that can be moved around. And that's another aspect in the walls to keep in mind that you can do things that are flexible, that are movable, especially if you're creating spaces for family place. You may relocate the family place to another area of the building. And so doing things that you are not stuck with, like painting things onto the wall, can be really advantageous. Form and void, scale and color can combine to create special niches. Uh, this is clearly a very, very fun part of the library. There are many, many images of this library with various arrangements of children, parents, and whatnot uh, in these niches. Graphics can set the tone and enliven the space. While this is not a children's space, I included this because I thought it was such a dramatic uh, example of a fairly simple graphic application that really changed what would have probably been an otherwise very ordinary connecting space. Colored glass can be used to create excitement and wow and, and do a number of other things in terms of sending messages. This is the lobby design for the Children's Public Library in Oman. This was an early um, rendering. If you see the sort of spherical balls of color, the idea is that those are colored glass nodules that will emit colored light into the space, casting colored uh, prisms throughout the lobby. And at night, we'll do the reverse on the outside. And there's some other images here that will show it a little bit better. This is the architectural model showing a little bit better how that will work. This is actually about a four story, um, four stories, which is about 40 some feet high by the same width. So it's a large area, large expanse of glass. And this is another other view of how that works. So it's really to denote the entry. This building is very contextual with the architecture in Oman. Almost everything in the country is whitewashed in one way or the other. Some buildings are beige, uh, but everything is fairly simple, understated architecturally. And this is how it might look at night with the colored glass really beckoning people to come in. There is a highway, one of the major highways to the airport is about probably about 400 yards, maybe a little farther from the building. And so they'll be able to see that there's something very special going on here. And just like in the Lansdowne Library or some of the other free library branches, branches pulling cues from the community I think is really important. In Oman, we pulled colors from the local Omani landscape. Even though the architecture is fairly monochromatic in Oman, um, there was an African influence in Oman uh, several hundred years ago that has lasted through the centuries. Uh, and, and they have these beautiful, 
beautiful doors and, and wood windows painted with bright colors throughout the country. The boats, many of them are painted beautiful colors. And the image on the upper right hand corner, if you're wondering, is a pottery incense burner. Of course, frankincense comes from Oman. So using the local colors in a different way to convey energy and life. This is the view of the children's library from, from the sea and from the causeway by the sea. And the actual the color is used on the three levels of the library that are actually public library. The lower level is parking and flood area. And the top floor is uh, a rentable space. And then this image shows a little bit better the development of the color. It became a little bit more brilliant. And how, how you might see the color both by day and night. And also the building illuminates from inside out. Local color is used again to dramatize the forms and elements on the interior of the building. And I'm still on walls, so another um, pull from the local community in Kentucky when we were doing the north side branch, um, there was a desire to have uh, coat storage at the entry to the meeting room, and there was a desire to have children's friendly coat at the, the uh, entry. So what we did was a modern rendition of shaker pegs. And this is sort of what they look like when you're going in. And actually on the opening day, the first person who hung a coat, it wasn't that cold, but the first uh, person who hung a coat was a child, probably about five years old, so it was great. <laughs> Color can define rooms or activity areas. This is that same building, the north side branch, a very simple open floor plan. When you come in, you can see everything. The highest shelving in this building is 60 inches. Uh, the children's shelving is, is uh, 40, I think it's 42 or 46. And so you can see the children's story room in the upper left-hand corner, and color defines it. Appliques can be used. Appliques can be a relatively inexpensive way to add interest. Uh, it might be something worth considering in um, and specializing your family place space, too. Here, they had to be thoroughbred horses. It took quite a bit of time to get to thoroughbred. Um, the uh, industrial design team and, I guess, architect for the Cerritos Library, and I had to put this slide in because it actually has building blocks in it, um, created this sort of fanciful themed entrance to the children's area uh, at the Cerritos Library, which some of you probably have been to. But doorways and apertures in the walls can be inviting. They can really make you wonder what's inside or give you the clue as to what's inside. And walls are a place to project things from, too. Signage doesn't need to be sort of glued onto the wall necessarily. Things can become three-dimensional. This is the outside of that story tale place in Horsham. And so to the ceilings. The elements of the ceilings, and these are very simple elements, are beams, joists. These are things that are structurally necessary to support the, either the roof or the upper levels of the building. The lighting, as we mentioned before. Um, skylights can be used in the ceilings. Clear story lighting, which is either lighting at the top of the, the room or something that's popped up through the roof and has uh, glass, either clear or some other kind of glass around it, and decoration and detailing, which I think you will see uh, in this building if you haven't walked around the building already. <clears throat> in putting this together, I realized that I think one of the things that we have maybe not focused so much in designing space for children, at least us, and I think maybe others as well in recent years, is the ceilings. We've been very focused on the low levels for the child, but Ceilings are an important part of the space, and it's, it's, it's part of the, the whole of the space. And so in this project, actually, I think what we did was we, we designed the Claire Story pop-up, the colored glass pop-up, in a way that has a circular, uh, circular colored glass so that as the sun moves around the building, it refracts colored light down onto the floor and to the walls. So, so all day that's happening. The lighting also can be used as a design element. It doesn't have to just be straight fixtures or recessed cans popped in. They can make a circle like this does, outlining a shape. 
there is serpentine accent lighting for the uh, tack boards that you can see, hopefully, uh, in the, uh, the image right above the other clear story windows, which are the clear glass windows. <clears throat> in, in Oman, <clears throat> there was a difference in the program, the required square footage, for, from the two main public floors of the library. The, the floor for young children and elementary school age children, and then the young teens and the teens. The young teens and the, the teenagers were on the upper level uh, of, the, uh, of the public spaces. And so what we did was, rather than do something sort of dull, we literally used the square footage requirement and created a very dramatic, what we call zigzag wall that is open from floor to floor, open visually. So from the top of that blue uh, partial wall to the next ceiling is glass, and that's the older children up there. The floor that we're looking at right now, that's actually the younger children's space. So you can see back and forth, and what that also does is if you remember the back view of this building, you can see out and see from the inside the colors around the frames of these windows. Um, the other thing, we did was create voids in the ceiling. This one, the circular one, is above the Omani uh, seating area uh, with, with a domed ceiling and a design with stars and a blue sky. Oops. <laughs> light. There's natural light, artificial light. Light can create mystery, brightness. It can be subdued, and it can be whimsical. Natural light can wash the space. It can create shadow and light. In this, in this uh, library, in a climate that is maybe not that dissimilar from Portland, uh, there's a lot of rain. There are a lot of overcast days. Uh, the architects took great care to make sure that there was a lot of natural light that would wash into the space in certain ways to really create a wonderful, wonderful feeling in the space. We use the interior light in this building design, again, to invite people in. If families driving along on the causeway or if they're in the park on the other side of this building, they see there's something important they might want to come into the library. They don't know about public libraries in Oman. Light can be special yet consistent. It's a little hard to see, but in the upper right-hand corner, there are two um, pendant fluorescent fixtures. These are in a, a standard sort of formation in that part of the library. But in the children's uh, story room, or program room, they're formed in a square inside the room. So it's a very simple, inexpensive way to distinguish an area. Even if that wasn't a room, that could be done if it was a different area. Uh, natural light can create the edge of, of a space. Uh, if it's consistent with, with artificial light, all the better. But it's important also to manage the natural light. Um, there are a lot of ways to manage the, the natural light and the artificial light in combination. There are um, technologies that are, are allowing to control the amount of uh, artificial light if you have a lot of natural light. So you can adjust that through the day, or it automatically does, or very simple things like have two lamps, and you can turn one, one of the lamps in each fixture off at certain times of the day. Uh, another device which is used here um, is uh, dot screens. Um, dot screens are little white dots of different shapes and sizes on the glazing itself that will reduce um, the UV and, and the um, direct sunlight by up to 70 percent, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Um, and this is actually the eastern facade of this building, so it was really critical uh, that, that we did something on the eastern facade for that. Th this also has um, a, like a solar veil type shade or a mecco shade you may have heard of. Actually, we have them in this room, but they're, they're opaque. <clears throat> there are different kinds of, natural, of artificial light, excuse me. Um, we use specialty lighting here to, to highlight this part of the collection in the uh, children's area of Horsham. It also, this, this unit divides the children's area and the adult area and is movable. And the light, this is our idea for the library in Oman. 
that we did in Horsham, which is when you're driving by, you really see what's inside and you're invited in. And there's also a focus on children. You see the pop-up, the clear story that was in the other images that says, this is something special. The children's area is prominent. This building is set back about an eighth of a mile from the street because of the zoning in the township. So it was really critical that there was something that, that drew people's attention as they were driving by. In this town, there had never been a library in over 300 years. So it's a real transition. Again, the prominence of the children's area here in the front corner. The location of the children's area if you're designing a new building is really important. And the furniture. Many different types of furniture, seating, book bins, book storage units, book nests, uh, cushions, tables, uh, shelving, and displays. <clears throat> Again, this Amsterdam project, very unusual for a library, I think, at least for American libraries, way of dealing with a shelving. Uh, it seems to work for them. Some fun uh, furniture throughout this library, this little uh, uh, resin, plastic resin seat on the right-hand side. Seating can create an area and reinforce the concept. This is certainly a, a, an unusual uh, piece of seating. The Red Ribbon Library. Dy dynamic, excuse me, I need more water. Dynamic elements can, can encourage activity and use. They can also be expensive. But in limited use, uh, they can really, really make a difference in the space. This is the backside of, of that learning station. And notice all, excuse me, notice also the wheels on all the furniture. <laughs> this is a library that, another Carnegie branch in Philadelphia that was not zoned for uh, age groups and sizes, although you can see that it is indeed the children's fiction in the before because of the large sign at about you know, 15 feet in the air. Um, so uh, this was a challenge, and, um, and, and this is what we did. Um, <clears throat> again, created an area that really said this is for young children, zoned it with the floor pattern, created some specialty furniture that was really relatively, it was built locally, it was relatively inexpensive. Uh, some artwork having to do with the southern plain, uh, the with the African plains, which was a, uh, an, a an area of interest of the uh, community in, in this neighborhood. Uh, another uh, image from Cerritos, connecting with the community. You see the waves. You immediately get the connection. You know, help. You see, there's a lot of. Uh, this is in a. Um, an area that uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people in the entertainment industry who live in Cerritos, and so it's a heavily themed library, which is, you know, really appropriate for who it serves. Going to the other end of the earth, literally, another building blocks image, very, very simple. I thought this was so sweet. Uh, building blocks that literally create a special area, uh, a small library in South Africa location, exactly, I don't know. This is from the uh, Minneapolis Public Library. Uh, furniture can be fun shapes and colorful cushioned seating. It doesn't have to be regular old chairs. I mean, thank goodness for the library. Furniture manufacturers who, for years, have provided quality furniture, but the options for us who are interested in uh, spaces for young children are, are still limited. Tying in the local thoroughbred theme again. <laughs> this was just insisted upon by the library. It was hard to get that thoroughbred, I have to tell you. And again, the thoroughbreds. Uh, varying heights for all ages of children. This was a really neat idea in the Amsterdam Library. Uh, so you can pull up uh, one of those polyresin, uh, whatever they are, Ottoman kind of things, or a pillow or stand. Uh, middle country, for those of you who've been there. Uh, I thought the important thing about this is really the space that's allowed. It's very, very important that there's room for a child or two children or maybe even three and a caregiver to gather. So 42 inches minimum, 48 inches is better, maybe even more than that if your space will allow in terms of width of stations. This, another nice thing about this, which is uh, a Hardy Holtzman project also, is that this anchored this wonderful curved wall. Uh, so it was very economical to power it. 
I'll say one thing about um, this that I said yesterday when I was talking about that same image. Particularly if you look in the back, you see a child with an adult. So when someone tells you that your children's space needs to be smaller than your adult services collection, just point out for every child there's a, at least one partnering adult with them, and therefore it needs to be twice as large as your adult services. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. And now, I did this when I was practicing this too. I got ahead of myself. But this, this is what I wanted to show you about moving the furniture in, in this village branch, which was, is so incredibly used. And, and so <clears throat> we really we were struggling with how we were going to get everything in and all the people that wanted to use it. I said, well, look, we have to put something on wheels. And uh, you know, some of the collections in this library, it was sort of problematic to put, put wheels on because we were afraid that they were going to really go around in the building during the day because some, some of the clientele is, is a little wild. And the next door neighbor is a pawn shop. Uh, so at any rate, this is what happens. The wheeled shelving moves out of the way. It's, it is on locks. You can lock the wheeled shelving. Most You want to be sure that you can do that or be sure that you don't need to do that in your library. And, and you can have a wonderful, uh, varied space. Mobile activity tables, all the wonderful things that, that Kathy showed you in the Family Place libraries. These rooms, if you're designing a new building or renovating your building, it's important to make space for things like Family Place, for activity tables like this that can be used in the off hours when there aren't special programs going on in these spaces. Again, you see the glass doors behind this little boy with the red shirt that open up so it can actually just become a part of the library. It's also completely visible at all times to staff. Uh, having seating that's comfortable and big enough for parents and caregivers, probably don't really have to tell you that, but <clears throat> it's important. Uh, types of tables and seating mixed together um, instead of just in little clusters can be very, very dynamic. Uh, the table in the foreground here was a special table. They wanted a table with this little recess square, if you can see in the middle, for children to be able to have crayons and things to, to draw with. <laughs> And it's very, very popular. It might not work in every library in the United States. <clears throat> uh, you can see the mix of furniture. The, all the shelving in Santiago is on wheels except the perimeter shelving. If you can see in the upper right-hand corner against the wall, that's the perimeter shelving that's fixed. But it's all low. It's, none of the shelving is higher than, I think, 46 inches. <clears throat> this is a, a, an example of the typical unit. There's also a place for labeling on each shelf. And all the materials in this library, it's 200,000 square feet, all the materials in this library are merchandised. They're all face out. There is a repository in the basement, and anything that, it, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting how the whole uh, operation works, and it circulates. Um, an ottoman, you don't have to use sofas and lounge chairs. The ottoman can be fun. Ottoman can be used for a caregiver and a child, or for storage of toys. Uh, flexible cushions, you see the different types of, of padded cushions here, different heights. Uh, seating that's big enough for groups. And then to the space itself, and to the key points of form, the things that really make space, form, void, the interplay of form, void, all those other elements that we talked about, the rhythm of things, the harmony of all the elements, and creating discovery. So just briefly on this, <clears throat> we really try to, to use form and void to the max in this library. You see the forms, oops, the form, it's not a pointer, the forms of the Omani seating area, the form of the computer Area, the form of the zigzag going back and forth all the way across this building, which is probably about the width of this building that you're in, just to get an idea of the scale. Um, the form and void of the apertures, the windows, and the color use on those, and the openings in the ceiling. Um, th these were studies we did in the Jacksonville Library competition of the interplay of floor, walls, ceilings, <laughs> color, light, and technology. And I'm just going to go through this quickly um, to show you the idea that you could do a design on all of the surfaces. And it could change throughout the time of day. 
bringing all these elements together to create uh, ambiance, as this project so beautifully does. Notice the wheels on the shelving on this end, and then it's on the, uh, uh, it must be a cutout into that platform. And while this is not a children's void, it, it certainly could be uh, a really wonderful, unique, or different kind of shape that really makes you just sort of want to go in and see what's going on. How inexpensive is that? It's drywall, and it's two colors of paint. Another wonderful aperture in this library in Denmark, an inviting window into, <laughs> into the space with the bean bags and the ribbon going through again, that, that con continuity of the idea. Back to middle country, uh, where the museum corner, uh, which is a really important part of the library in middle country in the children's area, is actually an entire form that juts out into the space. So immediately when you get into the library portion of the building and you look around, you see this. You see this. It's you, Hardy, Hardy Holtzman used Hardy board on, on the wall of this, which is an exterior building material painted red. <clears throat> and the displays change all the time in, in the uh, museum corner. Uh, forms and voids to create fun and cozy spaces. These cylinders, the local architect in Santiago, Cox and Ugarte, uh, created these wonderful cylinders. And um, <coughs> children of all ages just love these. They, they, they can't, uh, they almost, they wait in queue to, to get in them or around them or under them and, and read. <laughs> And they survived the earthquake. Uh, the story bowl in, inside this space, the local architect created this. The only problem with this is it has stairs. But it's really a wonderful form. And as you can see, when it's in use, you really know there's something there in the middle of this space. Even the uh, installers of the furniture had fun with it. <laughs> It's a just it's a really really flexible dynamic space with all kinds of mats, different types of furniture, hard surface flooring, so you can really think differently about uh, space and how space might be accommodated for children. And with that, I thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>